Hey guys, welcome back. This is Dr. Marwa and today I'll be talking about cardiorenal syndrome. I know that your exams are very close and your PT is stressed out about it, but I'm just going to mention a quick hack by which you will be able to understand the five subtypes of cardiorenal syndrome relatively easily. So let's get started. The first and the foremost would be that if the problem is in the heart of the patient, let me say it could be ischemic cardiomyopathy, it could be acute myocardial infarction. So the blood supply of the kidney will be affected. This is going to contribute to a renal failure. It could be acute kidney injury. It could be chronic kidney injury in a patient. The message is type 1 and type 2. They are mainly related to problems starting from the heart. And then the kidney is an innocent bystander. In contrast, when it comes to type 3 and type 4, the problem starts from the kidney. Let me say the patient is having a diabetic nephropathy. I had suggested this patient to go in either for transplantation, recurrent hemodialysis, but the patient did not follow any of the two advices. So in all patients of CKD, you very well know there would be hyper aldosteronism that will cause volume overloading and that volume overloading will definitely affect the function of the heart. So the message for you guys is that when it comes to type 1 and type 2 cardiorenal syndrome, the problem starts from the heart. Whereas when it comes to type 3 and type 4, the problem starts from the kidney. In fact, to ease it out before you, I would like to use the word renocardiac so that you can remember uh, type 3 and type 4 is where the problem stems from the kidney per se. Now before I talk about type 5, let us just invest a little bit of more time talking about the subtypes that I've just enumerated before you. For type 1, the case-based scenario that can be given to you is of a patient who had a STEMI or a non st elevation MI involving the left main coronary artery. You very well know that if the left main coronary artery of the patient or LAD of the patient is affected, then the left ventricular function will be hampered. This can definitely contribute to acute decompensated congestive heart failure. So you're going to be having pulmonary edema, a third heart sound, an arrow split second heart sound, elevated JVP and all the aspects that I've discussed. But the point is in all of these patients because of the acute decompensation, the blood supply to the kidney would be hampered. This is going to contribute to development of acute kidney injury in the patient and therefore the urea creatinine values will definitely start spiking and in clinical practice the commonest variety of cardiorenal syndrome that we come across is type 1. Now let's take up another scenario. A patient is having triple vessel disease. I suggested this patient that sir you need a CABG or let me say it was a double vessel disease or a single vessel disease so I suggested a stenting but the patient did not follow my advice and developed the ischemic cardiomyopathy. If a person will develop ischemic cardiomyopathy then ischemic cardiomyopathy will contribute to chronic congestive heart failure. This is also going to contribute to decrease in the perfusion of the kidney and that will again contribute to chronic kidney disease. So you can very well see that in type 1 and type 2 the problem starts from the heart. It's only a difference of acute versus the chronic one. Now let's take up type 3 and type 4. Again, I'll divide this into acute and the chronic versions. The point is, suppose a patient is having acute kidney injury due to volume overloading. Like let me say there was a bomb blast and uh, subsequent to that, a couple of people were injured or a soldier was injured and he had substantial blood loss. This is going to contribute to his renal shutdown because the perfusion of the kidney was affected and once the kidneys are going to shut down, you very well know the values of aldosterone are definitely going to spike. This is going to contribute to retention of salt and water in the body. So the volume overloading that's going to occur in the patient. I repeat the fact once again, this chap has had acute kidney injury. The volume overloading will definitely compensate the heart of this patient and can cause a development of acute uh, decompensated congestive heart failure. So you can see it is reverse happening. On the other hand, let's take up another scenario. A person having a diabetic nephropathy. So lots of these patients will end up in chronic kidney disease subsequently. Now chronic kidney disease will obviously contribute to activation of the RAS system and that will contribute to high blood pressure. In fact, for management of this very high blood pressure, we can be using AC inhibitors or calcium channel blockers. Obviously, if the potassium is high, we will be moving on to calcium channel blockers in these patients. The problem is this particular hypertension that I've underlined will contribute to a left ventricular hypertrophy. A lot of patients of CKD, if they're not managing their blood pressure well, will end up with left ventricular hypertrophy. The end result would be a diastolic malfunction of the heart. And the technical term that he can write for this diastolic malfunction of the heart can be 
heart failure with preserved ejection fraction as you very well know from a lecture i mean the word preserved does not mean that ejection fraction is 65 percent preserved simply means that the ejection fraction of the patient would be in the range of about 50 percent or a little higher than that the message is that acute and chronic word is again getting repeated it's just that you need to get the orientation right the orientation is that first it is the heart getting involved then subsequently the kidney whereas in type 3 and type 4 it is the kidney getting involved and then the heart and it's both acute and chronic severely now once you get that we come to the last one that would be type 5 relatively easy to understand incidence of COVID-19 has anyway skyrocketed anywhere in the world so lots of time you would have seen your patients of COVID-19 pneumonia who end up with multi-organ failure that multi-organ failure can definitely affect the kidneys of the patient as well. So the message is when it comes to type 5, it is mostly due to systemic diseases. These systemic diseases can cause a release of toxins and thereby both the heart as well as the kidneys of the patient can definitely be affected. Both can be affected even simultaneously as well or can be serially as well. The best example I can give for this is sepsis that would be occurring in patients of COVID-19 pneumonia who deteriorate ultimately to ARDS and then end up with multi-organ failure and then develop sepsis. Then could be even, uh, I would say from general medicine perspective, vasculitis can affect both. Like you very well know that pan can be affecting, if not treated well, both the heart as well as the kidneys, the coronary arteries can be affected, renal circulation can be affected. Then uh, I can incorporate uh, conditions from pathology like amyloidosis where both heart, you very well know, in amyloidosis it is restrictive cardiomyopathy and when it comes to kidney involvement that's one of the important reasons of death. You have pale and large waxy kidneys that you study. So the message is if it is systemic diseases it is type 5. So I hope that data is clear. Heart getting involved followed by kidneys 1 and 2 acute and chronic respectively. If it's the kidneys getting involved first followed by the heart acute and chronic 3 and 4. So any case based scenario that they give on basis of this you would be able to correctly answer the 5 types of cardiorenal syndrome. I would also like to highlight the fact that when we read about congestive heart failure, we always study that yes, there is a volume overloading and uh, yeah, the kidneys of the patient can be affected. Now, a common query that I get from a lot of my doctors is that sir, in congestive heart failure, I mean, are you implying that the perfusion of the kidney would be so serially or so seriously affected that the kidney is going to be compromised? Let me just give you an explanation for that. You see, let us take this to be the representation of the glomerulus. Now you have a efferent arterial, you have a efferent arterial, so I'm just going to put an A and an E for it. You very well know the fact that when you have filtration occurring across this glomerulus, then there is going to be a pressure gradient rate. I'm just going to write A minus E, that is, this is going to be the gradient which is responsible for filtration across the kidney. Now what volume overloading causes is that it increases the efferent arteriolar pressure. I repeat the fact once again because there is congestion everywhere in the circuit. So therefore the efferent arteriolar pressure can be increased and the increase of this pressure will definitely contribute to a mathematical reduction in the gradient. I know, I mean, personally, I, I, I don't like mathematics and I hate even, you know, getting into the aspects of mathematics, but here I have to. So I just repeat the fact once again, I said volume overloading is going to contribute to increase of the efferent arterial pressure. This is going to mathematically decrease the gradient which is responsible for filtration and therefore, I mean, the kidney is not going to do its job well. So obviously the markers which are related to renal failure will dramatically start increasing. Uh, though you would be seeing lots of your volume overloaded patients in your hospitals, just a quick next 30 seconds into what are you going to see in any patient having a volume overloading, the JVP of the patient may not be falling with inspiration, the column would be shooting through the hoof uh, and I can also use the technical word third spacing. Now, when I say the word third spacing, the concept is that when hydrostatic pressure in the blood vessels is increased, it's going to contribute to uh, pulmonary edema. So, you would be able to hear crackles or fine crepitations in the chest of the patient. There would be anywhere left ventricular malfunction causing a hypotension. The compensatory mechanisms would kick in. So, heart rate of the patient will be increasing through the roof. You very well know the formula, maximum heart rate possible 220 minus age. And because the kidney is getting involved in some of the cases on a chronic basis, so there could be a pallor that might be appreciated, there might be a decreased urine output that might be reported by the patient or noticed in your input output monitoring. So 
the science of overload uh, would be primarily you know the presentation of any case of cardiorenal syndrome and well what do you have from pharmacology that you can use to handle these patients so if there's a, a definitive uh, pulmonary edema component furosemide is obviously the best bet you can give an IV shot but uh, if the person is I would say not being hospitalized due to obviously shortage of beds lots of time I, I personally had to handle this situation where I handled cases of heart failure with tosemide so just a quick recap i mean i know you know about these drugs so uh, bumetanide can definitely be used uh, most of the time you would have also noticed especially those of you who are in practice would have noticed the fact that when you are giving loop diuretics to the patient a lot of time you may not get an optimal response so in those circumstances you can add thiazides now in cardiorenal syndrome which thiazide would be useful so it is not the standard ditide or thiazide or hydrochlorothiazide that we use rather it is metazolone that is used and the advantage of metazolone as you know from pharmacology would be helping in control of blood pressure also because in the system the RAS system is uh, in fact uh, upgraded. Apart from this, uh, if you read the medical literature, it also says that ultra filtration uh, can be used for these patients, especially for the volume overloading component. But that would require, I would say, uh, intensive facilities to be available. And when routine hospitals are shut down, the best you can do for your patients is that would be my personal advice usage of both loop diuretics as well as thiazide so that, I mean, the distress of the patients who are suffering from cardiorenal syndrome can be reduced. So this was a quick overview regarding the five subtypes. It took a few minutes, I know that, but just get the orientation right from this slide. You can just take a snapshot of this and you would be bang on and remembering if any one of these is ours. My best wishes, keep studying guys. And I, I, I'm very sure you would come out with flying colors. As I always say, keep hammering and you definitely go on to the other side. Take care.